Our speakers today, Megan Jensen is the Director of Literacy Impact at Carnegie Learning, and Heather Samsell is the Director of Professional Learning Design for Literacy at Carnegie Learning. Heather, would you like to begin? Sure. All right, here we go. This is the arc of our session today. We will start by discussing how oral reading fluency fits into foundational reading instruction. We'll examine how to target student needs and use research-based strategies to respond to their oral reading fluency needs. And finally, we'll dig into the benefits of using digital tools to support students growing in reading accuracy, rate, and prosody in service of them becoming more skilled, confident readers. Now, before we begin, we do want to hear a little bit from you. So I'm going to launch a poll. Just let us know what you're interested in learning about today. Ooh, I can see them populating now. Got about ooh, 50, ooh, 75. No surprise for one of these. That's pretty high up there, Megan. <laughs> I'll share the results in a minute. I'll give you about uh, 10 more seconds to go ahead and vote if you can. Oh, all right. Well, I see that we have 51% of us looking forward to using digital reading fluency tools. No surprise. That's the title. So we're glad you're here. We have 14% of us looking forward to figuring out what oral reading fluency is and how you can explicitly teach that to your students. 22% are looking for how to support students in improving their prosody, which is awesome. We're going to talk a lot about that and show you some examples. And the remaining 13% are looking at how to fit and schedule oral reading fluency into your classroom practice, which is a really interesting question that we will get to. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. So I want to start by defining what oral reading fluency is, because that is something that a lot of you had pointed out you wanted to learn about and how we explicitly teach that in the classroom. We are gonna have you actively participating in the chat for the next few minutes, which it looks like you've already mastered. So go ahead and pop the chat box open and get your fingers ready because I'm gonna have us answer a few questions. We're gonna start with this little experiment. This is a text written by the International Phonetic Alphabet. And I want you simply to read the text and share in the chat. How did you feel while trying to read this text? And what made it difficult? I'm gonna give you about two minutes to read this text and answer those two questions. I'll also put the questions in the chat for you. <laughs> oh, you guys were ready on the chat, awesome. <laughs> I'm frustrated, what made it difficult? Read it because of language, not clue. I'm not sure. I don't know orthography. Feels like I'm reading a different language. My brain is doing mental flip flops. <laughs> so I want to know what these symbols mean. I want to know what they mean. Like reading Beowulf. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> yes. You A little English. awkward. Totally awkward. Yes. We have some guesses. Maybe there's a question in there because we can see a question mark. We know what that symbol means. Yeah, that's true. All right. Brain freeze. So I'm going to give you a little hint to make this a little bit easier. On this next slide, we have some clues here for what some of these symbols might sound like. So using the clues that you have here. How does your comprehension improve with the code here? So same thing in the chat. Share who was thinking, if you can figure that out, and what animal was caught. Ooh, some of us are coming up with some answers. The fishing king. A king was fishing. Lots of fish. We're figuring out some of it. So by just sharing a little bit of the code, we're able to interpret this. Let's look one more. This is what that passage is actually saying. <laughs> Oops, a lot of us came up with a king was fishing. So 
foundational skills are needed and explicit teaching in those are needed for students to be able to interpret the text that we're providing them. That's the whole purpose of this. We want them to make meaning of text. And so we need to be very careful and, and explicit in helping them crack the code of the English language. It could have taken us a lot of time if we would have just sat there and tried to unpack this whole paragraph or even longer if it were a longer text. And without the instruction that we provided to at least give you that code, we wouldn't be able to do that very well. And so we need to be considerate of that as we're teaching our students. And Megan is going to teach us a little bit more about what that looks like. Thanks, Heather. Okay. So how do we get to the work of making meaning from the text that we read? Quite like on that last slide Heather showed you, when you saw the text in the English language, you were most likely able to automatically read that text very quickly and understand what the king was doing, uh, that he was fishing, and so on. So how did you get to that point for yourself, and how do we get our kids there? I'm showing you a uh, model of reading that you have most likely seen before on many a webinar. Uh, it still remains very popular for, for its simplicity uh, in conveying the way that we learn how to read. This is the simple view of reading from Gowan Tumner, first published in 1986. This is a theory that continues to endure because it so simply demonstrates how we need both sides of this equation you see here. We need decoding skills. We need to have known what those symbols on the page, what sounds, pardon me, those symbols on the page represent in order to apply our sound symbol associations to decode words. We need to know that word's fish in order to picture the fish in our minds. So that yellow side of the simple view of reading equation has everything to do with understanding what that code on the, on the page, what sounds, pardon me, the code on the page represents. Once you know that word says fish, you can shift to the blue part of this equation here, language comprehension. You can picture a scaly silver fish in your mind, for instance. You can picture a silly king wearing a crown at a lake's edge fishing. The, the thing I say over and over again, and I'd love for you to take from our time today, is that the simple view of reading is a multiplication problem for a huge reason. You can't multiply any number by zero and get a sum that isn't zero. You cannot just have strong decoding skills. You cannot just have strong language comprehension skills and move on in your life to make meaning from the text that you read. Our kids can't have this either. In our conversations about the science of reading in the United States, but certainly around the world now too, when that word reading is used, it tends to refer to the work of decoding. Really, when we say the word reading, we are referring to both sides of this equation. We're referring to reading and language comprehension. They both get us to overall reading comprehension. Where does fluency come in? Why we're all gathered here today. You can picture fluency as the bridge between these two sides of the equation, between that decoding work and the language comprehension work. We now have decades of settled research confirming that every student can benefit from an explicit, sequential, and systematic approach to learning those decoding skills. We can think of that skill of reading fluency as the bridge after kids have built those uh, sound symbol correspondences, those phonic skills, and applied those phonic skills to decode with accuracy. Then they move on to the work of building fluency. When we become fluent readers, we can shift our mental energy away from decoding and away from recognizing those irregular words on the page and toward making that movie in our head and comprehending those words um, and connecting our comprehension across longer texts. So there is this very strong connection between fluency and comprehension. Because fluent readers shift their attention away from decoding, they can attend more directly to the meaning of the text and get all the way over to that reading comprehension work that we really want students to get to. Very importantly, we tend to assume that if students can decode, they'll, they'll become fluent. Probably a reason why many of you are here is because you know that's not the case. We can have really strong decoders who all of a sudden get to a paragraph of text on the page and read very slowly, word for word, don't attend to comprehension at all, begin making errors. Many kids, especially struggling readers, might not gain overall reading fluency independently. 
for this reason, this is why we need to give stu our students practice with developing fluency through the methods we're going to be talking about today and through digital tools that can really make that work more efficient in the classroom. So we're talking a lot about fluency. What is it? Here's a high level definition. It is simply the ability to read text with accuracy, appropriate pacing, which we will talk about a lot today, and expression, all to do that work of supporting your overall comprehension, your overall understanding of what is happening in the text, text you are reading. I'm going to illuminate those three green terms a little bit more because it can get confusing. When we talk about accuracy, it's quite what it sounds like. Are you able to read the word fish? Fish. Do you know what each what sound each of those letters or letter pairs represents? Can you decode that word accurately to get the word fish and not fosh, whatever you might miscue it as? Rate is the work of reading the overall text with appropriate pacing, not going too fast or too slow, not going word for word. When we go too fast or too slow, that inhibits or makes harder our ability to comprehend effectively what's happening across a whole text. We might get a few words here and there, but we're not really taking in the whole story or making that full movie, ongoing movie in our mind when we read. Finally, prosody, what we're really gonna talk about more today, and that is the work of reading with expression. So let's talk a little bit more about what expression is and what really its component parts are. Heather, back All to you. All right, thanks, Megan. So as Megan said, let's unpack what prosody looks like. I'm gonna to return to the slide that she shared with a little bit more of a description just to remind us our goal for unpacking prosody is to consider pitch, stress patterns, and duration. Pitch in how we are lowering or bringing our voice higher when we're actually reading something. Our stress patterns is the way that we're emphasizing certain syllables or even words sometimes. And then the duration is how much time we spend on each of those words and phrases. We're going to go through an example of that, but I really want to share that really prosody is about rhythmic and tonal aspects of speech. It's kind of the music or that sing-song nature of our spoken speech. And when reading aloud, and we do that with appropriate prosody, our reading sounds like the spoken language, like it should. And prosody includes features such as our pitch, those stress patterns in the way that we're emphasizing, and those specific duration for the words and phrases. These features of prosody provide information about the meaning of language beyond the literal meaning of the words themselves. So we're going to do another little practice together. And because I'm a foodie, we're going to look at a sentence here three different ways. The first one, we're going to consider reading this set of words with no punctuation. Heather ordered queso. Great. <laughs> Not much to it. If I read it when Heather was lactose intolerant, how would we read it then? We'd say Heather ordered queso, something along those lines. <laughs> and then if I read the same sentence, let's just call it, uh, as if we were with a group that just finished a long hot trail run on a Sunday, because that's what we do. We'd be like, ooh, Heather ordered queso. We'd get really excited about it. And the way that we say it would convey a particular meaning. And that's what we mean when we're developing students' prosody practice. So really, it's about fluent readers and what they're able to do when they're using appropriate phrasing, grouping those words together into meaningful pairs. And students are not reading word by word when they're practicing prosody. We don't hear that choppy cadence where it's maybe one word at a time, or we're not able to make comprehension and connection between different words and phrases in the sentences. That is not going to support clear comprehension. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about prosody. An easy thing to convey to the students we work with is that when we read out loud, it should sound like we speak. We, we don't speak flat like this all the time. We give our voices inflection. If we have a question, we raise our voice. 
if something surprises us, we change our intonation. We take pauses between phrases or between sentences. So a really simple way to start the conversation about prosody, which I was a reading specialist and I'm, I'm the first to tell you it was often the trickier concept for students to understand uh, when we were practicing fluency. And an easy way to move forward with that conversation with kids of all ages is just to refer them back to how we sound when we speak. And feel free to use that Heather ordered queso quick activity. Give kids a silly line, no matter their age, it's funny. Um, when you're lining up, when you're transitioning between subjects in your class and have them read it in different ways, just to help them become aware of how we do change our intonation and our phrasing uh, and our overall expression when we speak based on the meaning of the words we're using. So we're, we've talked about prosody. Let's get into how we can support students with building all the elements of fluency, accuracy, rate, and prosody. We're going to start by talking about the actual materials, the text that we need to start with when we're working on building oral reading fluency. And then we'll get into thinking about digital tools that we can use with these types of texts. So to get you into that conversation about texts, I'd like for you to take a moment to look at these two texts. And then I would like for you to share in the chat, what do you notice is different between them? Put that question in the chat for you, and I'm going to give you 30 seconds to read both texts on the left and the right. Go for it. Okay, seeing the word repetitive a lot to describe the text on the left with the fox. I saw a few pe people connecting, yes, the pictures with the fox on the left with the words below. Short sentences versus more complex sentences. The text on the left has a pattern, the text on the right does not. Great points I really like about uh, our, we have a more ability to apply expression to do the work of prosody with the text on the right-hand side. More high-frequency words on the right. Yep, yep, yep. I'm in agreement with you. Thanks for offering those responses. I heard some, or I saw somebody uh, say this in the chat. We, we see the text on the left is that what we call a predictive text. By predictive, it means students can predict what that last word in each sentence says effectively. They can make very good educated guesses because of what's happening in the images. My garden has seeds. We can see the fox pointing seeds. My garden has birds. We can see birds in the picture above. So as kids memorize that phrase, my garden has, they can make educated guesses rather than doing the work of applying everything they've learned from their phonics instruction to actually decode birds, but birds, birds. So rather than doing that decoding work, they can make a guess. There's birds in the picture now. That probably says my garden has birds. On the right-hand side, as many people have pointed out, we can't do that same work of predicting what the text says based on the images. For one thing, the images really just don't give us enough of that information. That text on the right is what we call our decodable text. It emphasizes specific phonemes that kids have learned uh, in class, it provides students with the opportunity, as a few people mentioned in the chat, to practice some of the irregular words or high frequency words they've been learning as well. And you can see some opportunities to practice consonant blends, like in the word swims. Um, we've got digraph, the digraph, sh, and fish, but plenty of consonant blends uh, here in this story about Sam and his dad. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because we, if we can't get students building their fluency with those types of decodable texts, eventually, they'll get into upper elementary and the secondary grades, and they will be exposed to texts like this one. This one is written at a fifth grade level. We can see it absolutely, you cannot simply rely on that picture alone in order to read the text on the page. We've got 
Standing on a beach, watching waves rise and crash onto the sand is an amazing sight, but the real action is happening underwater. Scientists who study the life in the ocean are called marine biologists. On it goes from there. We can't discern that this passage is about marine biologists simply by the photo of the coral reef. If I were to take a wild guess, if I was your fifth grade student and wasn't able to decode or didn't read with fluency, I'd just think, well, the whole thing's about yellow fish who live in coral reefs. So point made here, we know as students age, they will not be able to rely on predicting what the words on the page say based on context and, and images. We've got to help them build not only the decoding capabilities, the overall fluency, so that they can shift to that green side of the simple view of reading equation. They can read for meaning. They can shift all their mental efforts toward that work of comprehension. Here's the summary. We have to move kids forward to conduct fluency instruction with what we call connected text. There's a lot of confusion out there about that term connected text. Super simply, all it means is text that contains related sentences. This small story about Sam is a great example. The fish swims past Sam. Sam swings his net. Sam lifts up his net. We're telling a story, sentence one, connects to sentence two, connects to sentence three. That's all connected text is. Really why it matters is we're helping students to build their stamina for tracking their comprehension across longer and longer passages of text. That way, when they get up into the higher grades and they do really have to track comprehension and make that movie in their head for longer text, they've got lots of practice. It's not so mentally taxing for them. We want that connected text to, for the most part, be decodable, or another term you might see is phonetically controlled. All that means is that text is controlling for the phonics patterns the and the irregular words that students see. That way they can get lots of practice with the phonics patterns and irregular words that they've been working on. Uh, the text isn't going to be so hard that they can't access meaning at all, uh, but it's also giving them enough of that practice so they can eventually move on uh, to more complex texts while still building that fluency. Okay, so let's get into instructional methods that use this type of connected text to build fluency. You can think of these instructional methods that use that connected text in three categories. On the far left of your screen, we have what we call assisted reading. We'll get into what that looks like in a moment. In the middle, we have repeated oral reading. We'll also talk about that for the remainder of our webinar. On the far right, we have independent silent reading, quite what it sounds like. Um, you can see my arrow on the bottom is simply to indicate to you the degree of independence, uh, student independence in each one of these methods. As you move from left to right, from fully assisted reading to the student reading completely silently on their own, you're removing the instructional supports. The teacher is not modeling, peers are not modeling, the student is reading on their own. So student independent is rising as we move from assisted reading all the way toward that ultimate goal, which is fluent silent reading, the way we all read as adults and the way we read in our work. So what is assisted reading? Quite what it sounds like, it is when a student practices fluency work through receiving assistance from a higher fluency reader. There are lots of different higher fluency readers around us when we're in school. The one we might all think of first is the teacher itself or her or himself or an aide in the classroom. Teacher assisted reading, we probably do all the time even without thinking about it. Uh, this is any form of reading aloud to our students to give them a model for how fluent reading should sound. So this is when we model things like accurate reading, not going too fast or too slow, and putting in expression into our oral reading. Peer-assisted reading is the next type of assisted reading here. Really a huge one to think about, um, uh, to bring in or to continue using in your classroom. It's been found to produce significant gains in fluency really for the last 30 years. We've had research uh, supporting um, peer-assisted reading. Additionally, this can give students a really socially supportive context to practice when we're attentive to the ways we're pairing students, of course, uh, because it can increase motivation when students are working with one another. 
So keep this in mind, especially for those students for whom reading can be really laborious, not fun. You know, pairing them with a slight or slightly higher fluency peer, um, you know, it can raise a little bit of the stakes, but in a way that can motivate rather than hinder uh, or make a student feel like they don't want to do it. In audio assisted reading, this is when students actually follow along in the text, generally tracking with their fingers while they listen to a fluent audio recording, typically through an audio book. This also has wonderful research behind it. What really matters if you are using audio assisted reading, really great tool for English language learners as well, is to make sure students see the words while they are hearing them read fluently. Students listening to the words can help them simply to access the meaning they might need for your class. But if we're really helping them build fluency, they have to be able to see the words with their eyes while they're hearing them through that audiobook. Okay, that second category of instructional methods I mentioned to you is called repeated oral reading. This is a really flexible method that we're going to stay talking about for a little bit because there's lots of different ways we can help kids conduct repeated oral reading in our classrooms. We can adjust plenty of different things here, which makes it just such a great teacher tool. We can adjust the number of times students reread. I did want to indicate to you that research shows student improvement and certainly motivation level off after three to four rereads. Typically, I recommend two to three before we want to move a student forward and make them feel like they're doing something worthwhile with their time in the classroom. We can, of course, adjust the instructional groupings for when kids are rereading. They can do this work independently if they're working with a digital tool. They can also work in pairs or with another adult, even in small groups. If you are uh, on the call here today and you tend to work with groups of four to six kids doing reading intervention or additional supports, having them just work as a whole group or partnering up in that group to do repeated oral reading can be really efficient and, again, very motivating and socially supportive for students. Finally, the third way you can really be flexible with getting that repeated oral reading work in to help kids build fluency is through adjusting the instructional strategy that you use with students. I want to offer you some guidance on how to adjust instructional strategies. So I've created a handout here for you. I'm going to put a link to it in the chat. And of course, you'll receive these resources after the webinar too. But when we think about adjusting the strategy that we want to use to help students get that repeated oral reading practice in to build fluency, my suggestion is to first think about the element of fluency or the component of fluency that the student really needs to build. Is it accuracy, rate, or prosody? We can only focus on one at a time. We only should focus students on one at a time. If it's accuracy, that's a scenario where students are either they're decoding or reading words uh, inaccurately, they're miscuing a lot of words, they are skipping over small words, or maybe they're, we see a lot of kids, right, flip small words to and a, the and from and for, just kind of saying whatever they think it is and not attending to the words on the page. If it's rate, we have so many kids, right, that speed through their fluency work, just are trying to get it done. Don't think at all about what's happening in the text. We really need to help them set goals around slowing down so that they can actually attend to the meaning of the words on the page. Finally, prosody, if that's the goal for students, we really want to hone them in um, through that conversation about thinking about what it sounds like when we speak and how we want to apply that kind of expression when we read aloud. So the resource I'm offering you today starts you off with thinking about that element of fluency your student or students need to build, and then moving on to think about the instructional support that your student can receive or that they're really ready to receive at this point. They may simply need to work with an adult for, for different reasons, either the, their skills are lower or they're just sort of in an emotional place where you know working with a peer is going to just make them feel really deflated and you really want to build them up through just working with them directly or having an aid work with them. They may absolutely be ready and totally excited about working with a higher fluency peer. That's when you can do something like partner reading, um, 
or um, timed repeated oral reading. So on my handout here, you'll see uh, when you open it up on your own screen, uh, you'll see some descriptions of what each of these methods look like. Phrase cued reading, we won't model too heavily today, but I did want to show, I saw a question about that in the chat. I think we have time, so I will um, just convey to you briefly. Phrase cued reading would be when we actually make marks on the text for students to indicate to them when we want them to take a short pause or a long pause. Typically, the way I recommend it is to write one slash when you want them to take a short pause, like when they see a comma, and two slashes when you want them to take a long pause, like when they see a period. So you are cueing to them how what their phrasing should sound like. Typically, that method in involves writing those marks on the text for the student, then modeling it aloud, and then having the student repeat you. If we have additional time, we can get into um, some more of your questions in the chat around the strategies. I want to give you 30 seconds to read my slide about providing response-specific feedback. I'll do that now, and then I'll share verbally for people on the phone. Okay. The point here, my friends, is with any strategy you use to get kids conducting that repeated oral reading fluency practice, the evidence-based is crystal clear on providing them with response-specific feedback when they, for example, make mistakes, um, flip small words, you know, read the word pin as pine, whatever it is you're hearing. When that happens, we want to give students the opportunity to finish the sentence they're reading because it's crucial to give them a chance to try to self-correct through monitoring their comprehension. If they read, I dropped the pine instead of I dropped the pin, we really want them to check their comprehension and make that correction for themselves. If they don't, then at the end of the sentence, we stop and point out that misread word. Hey, I heard you say pine, this word is pin. I really recommend repeating back what the student said or getting your, your students in the habit of repeating back what their partner said because we want to help kids build self-awareness or metacognition about how they're reading and what their errors are so they can eventually go on to do that themselves. We want to stop, point out their misread word, say the correct word, ask the student typically to point to that word on the page and repeat it, and then go on and reread that sentence and continue rereading um, the text as a whole. Super, super important. Um, again, thanks, Teresa, in the chat, pointing out we're really aiming to get kids to become self-aware. We want them self-monitoring and self-correcting. That's what we all do as adults when we get when we read things in the news or in other languages and we, we haven't seen words before, we self-correct for ourselves. Okay. So when students conduct these repeated rereads, um, whether they're working with a digital tool or directly, you know, with an analog text with an adult or a peer, it's crucial that they attend the instructional goal for each read. I mentioned to you, we really want students focusing in on if their goal is accuracy, rate, or prosody. We don't want to tell our students, oh yeah, we're just going to work on accuracy and prosody today. It's an overwhelming uh, um, thing to do that. We really want to focus them in order to help them become self-aware uh, and correct for themselves. So I'm offering you this four-step method to keep in mind when you support students in setting their fluency goals. And then we're going to talk about how to use this method when kids are using digital fluency tools. First and foremost, consider the influences on your students' fluency. Influences are things like background knowledge and vocabulary. If our students don't have a lot of background knowledge on whatever the content of the text is, they may read more slowly simply because they are not following along. They do not know, they cannot access meaning for the words on the page. We also want to think about their overall decoding speed and accuracy. We tend as a culture to focus a lot on speed, uh, and that is to the detriment of comprehension. It is okay if you have worked with a student for the entire year and they're still pretty slow but they're getting through, they're accurate, and they're reading with great comprehension. We simply don't want them to be so slow that reading 
is laborious and basically takes too long for them to get through uh, in a reasonable period of time. You also want to consider their metacognitive abilities. What I mean by this is we all have those kids that simply do not attend to their comprehension. They're just not checking in with themselves. They're just trying to get through whatever the activity is. Those are the kids we really need to help slow down and check that movie they're making in their head. So consider those influences on student fluency. From there, after you've heard the student read, you wanna prioritize your response-specific feedback, just as we said. My recommendation is to prioritize in this sequence. First, accuracy. If we can't read with accuracy, we don't know what's going on on the page. Then, prosody. We really want students to become aware of their expression when we read. We only then go to rate. I see a lot of people go for accuracy and then rate and leave prosody completely out. And I think that leads a lot of students to just read fast and think, I'm done. That's reading. And when we do that, students don't attend to their comprehension. That's the overall point of reading with fluency, right? Comprehending what we read. So my suggestion for you is when you sit with your student, listen to them read, or you hear their recordings through a digital fluency tool, you prioritize your feedback to help them set the goal for their next read by accuracy, prosody, and then rate. And then as I mentioned, you set that goal. You're sitting with a student, which Heather and I will model for you in a moment, and you say, accuracy is great. I don't see you flipping any small words anymore. Nice job. Let's move on to making sure we're raising our voice when we get to that question mark, right? Finally, model that reread. Model the way you want it heard, and then give the student the opportunity to repeat that modeling. So let's practice this with an audio clip. Very brief. I'm going to share a real student sample with you. And then I'd like you to respond in the chat. What do you notice about this student prosody? Typing this in the chat for those of you that like to read. And what do you think their next goal should be? I'm going to re, or pardon me, play this audio file, and I'd like for you to think about those two questions. Frog fable. You've got to be kidding, said the princess. A frog had just riveted in my, in her ear something so silly, so out, something, something, so, something so silly, so outrageous that she could hardly keep from laughing. The frog, it seemed, wanted to marry her, but he was slimy, he was dull, he wasn't even as cute as the big-eyed, brightly colored poison dart frogs that live in the Amazonian rainforest. Sorry, said the princess, you don't look anything like a prince. Eventually, you don't look anything like a prince. Anything. Anything like a prince. Eventually, of course, the princesses found out that even the ugliest frog can be a prince in disguise. Today, science... Okay, I'll pause there. All right, I'm seeing... Go ahead and throw in the chat. What did you notice about this student's prosody? Overall, yep, yep. I'm seeing a lot. This is, I'm, we all, I mean, this is such a typical case, right? Um, she's, she's going fast. She is really just attending. She is definitely attending to accuracy. You heard her repeat certain uh, words until she was sure uh, that they were accurate or they sounded accurate to her. Yeah, it's a challenge. And so she's, the, she's not stopping. She's trying to just get through it. In particular, I'm also hearing no expression or very little expression, speeding through punctuation and trying to move quickly. Mm -hmm. So thanks, my friends. My next question is, what do you think if you were sitting down with the student or she had recorded herself in a fluency tool and you listened to it with her, what's the next goal you would set for her? Right, we know we want to model. We want to model slowing down and reading with punctuation. I think that's a great next goal for this student. We could have the printed text in front of her. We might even do that phrase cueing. Great. Thanks, Tracy, where we, we uh, draw those slashes where we want her to take a short pause and then a long pause. Model that phrasing for her and then have her reread that text. This is absolutely a student who we want to reread two to three times to build that fluency. Excellent. Thanks for working through that with me. So now let's think about those digital tools that we've been chatting about.
I've seen some very hungry folks in the chat waiting for digital tools. So let's move into this part of our webinar today. How can digital fluency tools help us when we're supporting students in building these tools? Well, they provide huge benefits to educators in helping students develop fluent reading, mostly in the two main ways you see on the slide. When we use technology to provide assisted reads for students, we're opening opportunities for them to hear fluent reading often through modeling. So there are tools that will actually read texts for the students so they can hear exactly how fluent reading sounds. As educators, it can be really hard to make sure that we're meeting with every student in our class to provide that same type of modeling for the texts that they are working through or learning how to read well. And digital tools can solve that problem for us. Technology literally takes that burden away by helping students hear how text should be read and then practice that. Which leads us into the second way that digital fluency tools can help us by conducting rereads. We know that students need different types of supports and practice to conduct these rereads effectively. And technology can support students in allowing them to listen to their recordings, to begin to identify errors themselves, either by feedback that the technology is providing or by being able to listen to themselves read. So identifying those errors and then also to help set specific goals for the next reread. How confident can our readers get when they can hear themselves improve time after time through a digital type of platform or program? Again, we use these tools to help students listen to themselves, to identify those errors, to sometimes provide very specific feedback and set a purpose for a reread. Megan and I are going to provide an example of what this can be like when you're sitting with a student. So I'm going to let Megan kind of set up the situation for us, and then we will go through an activity. Yeah. Um, so you're just, you're seeing a text from uh, our, our fluency tool, and certainly in the Q&A session, we can talk to you about some other tools we know about too. Uh, Marilyn had a great point in the chat. Many of these digital fluency tools read the text to the students beforehand. This one does that as well amazing efficient use of your time in the classroom. There's no way you can, you know, provide that modeling for every student on a regular basis. You don't have that time. So this is a place where tech just really helps. So let's picture we've got a classroom of fourth graders and we've sent five students to the back of the room where the computers are and they are working on this digital fluency tool. Heather's one of those students. All those students have conducted, they're, do, they're working on repeated oral reading with text at their, their appropriate reading level. Heather has done a first read of this text called In the Rainforest. And I'm the teacher, once a week at a minimum, I'm making it my goal to get to the back of the class and sit with each student to listen to their recording with them so that we can move th through that four-step process where we talk together about how their reading sounds and what their goal should be for their next read. So picture I'm the teacher, I get to the back of the class, and Heather and I listened to her recording of her first read of In the Rainforest. It sounds like this. Weird, wonderful animals live in rainforests. Many live high in the trees. The chameleon lives in a rainforest in Africa. It catches insects with a quick flick of its sticky tongue. Thanks, Heather. Okay. So we've read that together. I'm going to start out with positive praise, right? Wow. You got all of those words right. Your accuracy is so good. I'm seeing how you're applying the phonics work we're doing in class. There's so many sight words in here that you're just reading so beautifully. Well done. Now I want us to talk about how we read with expression. Because when we read out loud, we want to sound like how we talk. And we talk with lots of expression. So I'm going to point out to you a couple of things I heard, and then I'm going, to sh I'm going to share how I'd love for you to practice changing your reading so that you're reading with expression. First, we can see a comma after that word weird. A comma means we take a short pause. I heard you say weird, wonderful animals. We want to take a short pause, not go so fast. So it should sound like weird, wonderful animals. Can you try that? Sure. Weird, wonderful animals. Woohoo! That sounds great. So when we see commas, we want to take that short pause. 
The other thing I want you focusing on when you read this text again is to make that longer pause when you hear when you see a period. I heard you taking that longer pause at the end of the line, not where we see a period. So here's what it sounded like. Weird, wonderful animals live in rainforests. Many live high in the trees. Instead, we want to take that long pause when we see the period. Weird, wonderful animals live in rainforests. Many live high in the trees. Okay, and on it goes, right? That was just a couple minutes of our time. You can picture I'm going to release Heather to record herself again so she can conduct her second read. Typically, I might have her do, do a third read of this to, to build that fluency, but she knows today her goal is to take short pauses when she sees commas and to take a longer pause whenever she sees a period. I can move on to the next student uh, in my station at the back of the room, and Heather is conducting a goal-based reread uh, working on her prosody next. Thanks, Megan. So you'll notice that these tools should not take away the role of a teacher for the student. We still have to help them figure out what it is they're focusing on and set those goals for the second read. And digital tools can help you do exactly that. They're just tools to help support students in their fluency building. It doesn't replace the teacher. But they do help provide us information as educators that we can use to help guide students in the right direction in building their accuracy, prosody, or rate. So if you don't have time to do that one-on-one -on -one work, as Megan was talking about, meeting with one student a week or sitting in the back of the room, we can at least help them figure out how to set goals when they're listening to themselves. If they're a little bit older, it could look like a checklist or something else um, through tools that you can see here on the slide. We wanted to make sure that we addressed some ideas that are both elementary and secondary specific because we know students are practicing fluency in a lot of grade bands. Uh, though we typically talk about it in the foundational reading block, we do have students, I had middle schoolers that were coming in and could definitely still practice reading with prosody to help build that comprehension. So we have some examples here. There are some free um, apps or different resources that you could provide. One of them to help build self-monitoring and correction was Google Motes. And that, if you download it through Chrome, it allows students to record themselves and you could have them do that on a regular basis and check back to see their goals. You could consider having them do recordings quarterly just to listen to themselves to see how they're growing if they're more proficient readers um, and help them set goals in between those quarters. And then another way is to is pointing to what a lot of people said in the chat, which is how do we use reader's theater and really engaging tools to help students continue to understand how to use prosody. We can practice using reader's theater or listen to another set of students reading it. We can consider how people are reading or speaking in the radio and podcasts and TV shows. We can use poetry to do this. We can help them like the Heather ordered queso sentence by giving them a sentence that can be used in multiple ways and providing different scenarios for them to switch those the way that they're saying it up. And then we can also help them perform spoken word poetry by watching and listening to others performing. I'm sure we have several experts that are here joining us as well. So please share some other ideas you have in the chat because we want to learn from you as well. Oh, yes. Google Read and Write is also a great Chrome add-on. Thanks, Megan. Oh, yes. Nursery rhymes for K-1 students. That's a great idea. Thank you, Candace. Yes, Tim Rosinski. She's Mega still book. an expert in fluency. Great yes. book. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Feel free to continue adding, and I'm going to pop it over to Megan for the sake of time. OK. Uh, as we close here, we wanted to offer two additional resources. You've heard us talk about helping students build self-monitoring and self-correction through this work of repeated oral reading. We want them to do that. 
all the time, right? In everything they do. But certainly with oral reading, um, the Iowa Reading Research Center has two lovely tools uh, that you can um, either give to your students or adapt um, in order to make them more age appropriate um, to help your students build their own goals or set goals as they're reading. So again, if you do have them on digital reading tools in the back of the classroom, you know, when or when you're doing small group time, they can actually each have their own goal setting sheet next to them especially if you can't come around, you don't have that time to sit with each student and help them set those goals. So again, we're just giving them tools to help become more independent with uh, monitoring, correcting, and setting new goals for their fluency work. There's also a fluency reflection guide I highly recommend. Again, really focused on helping kids become metacognitive and reflective about how they're reading and what they want to adjust going forward so that they can move toward greater fluency. So those resources are in the chat for you as well. And thank you. Yeah, continue to share any additional digital tools that you are using that provide students, again, with those decodable connected texts that they can build fluency with. So we're up to the question and answers portion of our, our time here. Yeah, Heather and Bagan, I'm looking through our questions right now to see which ones we've um, touched on already. Um, there is an EL one. Megan, did you want to touch on that? Yes. Um, can you let me know what the question is, though? We have more than one. Um, most recent, how to help bilingual students to improve their second language English reading. Okay, perfect. Yeah, you know, really, it's what we were we've been talking about today. Uh, no different. Uh, in particular, we really want to focus on clear modeling. I think this is just yet another space where these digital tools that provide the audio for the student before the student tries practicing are so helpful and effective. I've also found if you're thinking in terms of gradual release, uh, you might start with uh, oh, I don't know if I'll get back to that slide, but you might start with audio assisted reading for students where they are hearing an audio book or you can use that Google read and write tool. Um, it's a Chrome add on. So you can if the student can pull up the website or the text, whatever you're using in Chrome, they can hear it read aloud as they're tracking the words on the screen. Um, so you might do audio assisted first and then move them into some repeated oral reading practice. Um, we don't, you know, the, the big point here that um, I'll share, I know is always on our minds, is we don't want to hold back English language learners from accessing the meaning of complex grade level texts. If they're in eighth grade, we want them building knowledge from complex eighth grade level text. We know they can't read that text independently, so we know they're going to have to, for the most part, listen to it, whether the teacher's reading it or um it's they're receiving an audio version of the text. So we want that to happen for those students whenever they're hearing the audio of that text. As I've mentioned, the research is just so clear on ensuring that they can see the text. Uh, they're not just listening to it. Heather, do you see any other questions you think we should address at this time? There was a question about how long student recordings should be for us as teachers to kind of analyze and provide feedback? It's a really good question. You know, if you're doing oral reading fluency assessment, the typical guidance is just 60 seconds. Um, for these, if you're using digital fluency tools, they're going to have longer texts. And, you know, we want it to be sort of fun for the kids. So stopping after 60 seconds of reading can often feel not very interesting or fun. I typically would do two to three minutes, but when you go to listen to the recording with the student, you can still just do 60 seconds because you're just really looking for their patterns and to help them set the goal for their next read. So I guess have, have a minute in your head, um, but it's no problem if the text is longer and the student's reading for a couple of minutes. That makes for a much more interesting story, for example, if they're reading uh, a narrative piece. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, I did have, um, I, there's one other question here about for emergent bilingual or English language learner students um, 
thinking about English to Spanish phonetical crossovers. So when we, that's the work of language transfer. So helping students look for cognates, for instance, words that look the same um, and sound the same in English and Spanish, for example. I haven't seen any digital fluency tools yet that call that out. I would love to. Um, and I think that's something to keep an eye out for if you're vetting digital fluency tools for your school. I haven't seen any digital tools that call out to the student, like, hey, this this word in English looks like or has a similar meaning to this word in Spanish. Um, right now, the best you can do is if you're a bilingual teacher, point it out. We know, again, the research is very clear on the benefits of language transfer. Kids are coming in with tons of language. Um, it's just in Spanish, and we want to help them build English. So any chance you can provide those connections verbally for the students, just go for it. We truly hope you are ready to incorporate some of these evidence-based strategies that we've mentioned today. Um, one of the tools that we mentioned today was clear fluency. Um, some of the things that touch on strategies Megan and Heather spoke to, um, and in this program, each selection includes an audio model of fluent reading. So students are able to hear uh, that reading with appropriate expression and pacing. Our students are reading and recording high interest and developmentally appropriate text inside of the program. And they're offered that chance for a repeated read and they get real-time corrective support as they're reading. This software offers opportunities for our teachers and students to listen to the recordings and teachers are going to be able to identify where they can provide that really specific feedback to help with improvements to accuracy, prosody, or rate. Um, and best of all, students are going to be motivated because they'll be choosing from an ever-growing library of topics and texts that they'll be super excited to read. All right, and I cannot leave without inviting you formally to Literacy for All, the National Institute, which is an immersive, inclusive, and dare we say fun professional learning opportunity in Scottsdale, Arizona this summer where we have keynote speakers from Natalie Wexler, Dr. Yolanda Seely ruez and Dr. Suzanne Simons. We will have anything from the clear fluency related items to hot topics in education and 35 breakout sessions for you to choose from. So if you are interested, you can use the QR code to get more information and we hope to see you there. Thanks again for attending the webinar. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Carnegie Learning or our software, um, please feel free to click on the link below.